it's a pleasure uh, to talk, let's say, for an audience that is, uh, let's say, interested in this uh, uh, topic. Uh, Anna asked me to talk a bit about, let's say, uh, current things that we are working on in terms of our research. Uh, I will highlight some things. I will also kind of uh, try to share you a bit with the vision that we have towards, let's say, process mining into the, the future. Today is uh, also a bit of a day where we present, uh, uh, let's say, a new tool. Anna just uh, uh, showed it to you. Uh, uh, Anna and Christian, they like to make products that people enjoy to use. And I, I think you, you could uh, uh, see that a bit. Uh, so a bit about the history of them, because this is today is a bit their party. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, they, are, they have been two brilliant, uh, let's say, PhD students, uh, let's say, working in the area of uh, process mining. Uh, Christian uh, uh, worked on PROM during his, uh, his PhD. Uh, he made PROM, I don't know, a zillion times faster than it was before. And he also developed the fuzzy miner. And I'm, uh, just to, to see how effective that a fuzzy miner is, uh, I also have colleagues in Australia that are using this. And, and they were uh, kind of showing it also to people in industry. Uh, and uh, uh, this colleague noticed that people's mouths would open if, you would, uh, if they would see the fuzzy miner. And he saw a kind of pattern. It's kind of nice that people at the other side of the world can actually uh, see that. Uh, Anne played a, an important role into, let's say, broadening the scope of process mining. I think what we see today is that initially the wow effect is very much there if you do discovery. Out of raw data you create uh, this process model. But what is then the next step? And in terms of the next step, performance analysis, understanding why there are bottlenecks, seeing where people deviate from the normative process, etc., etc. So I think replay, replaying reality on top of a model that provides insights is the most important thing of process mining. And of course, you can only do that, or in many cases, you can only do that by discovering first the proper uh, uh, model. But she, in her work, started, let's say, broadening the, 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 the scope. So as I said, I would like to uh, talk a bit about our vision and then uh, uh, kind of briefly let's say, talk about some of the things that we are uh, working on. So first, the, a bit of the vision. And I realize that some of you in the audience kind of know that I like to use uh, uh, metaphors. Uh, uh, like there is a bit of a debate in, let's say, people that are interested in, let's say, re-engineering business processes, whether you should actually look at what is really there, what people are really doing. Uh, I often use the metaphor of desire lines, and if you are Dutch, you perhaps know the expression uh, olifantenpaardje, elephant trail. And these are the trails that, uh, let's say, people leave when they walk through grassy areas, and you can see kind of where they have walked. That provides useful information. There are also people in the business process re-engineering school that say you should not look at that. You should not look what people are doing. Uh, just think about the way that it should be done. And there is a saying, don't pave cow paths. And, 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 and that's what you see here a bit. Uh, so I think there is a truth in, let's say, both types of uh, uh, views. Uh, this is, a, I think, in my view, a very funny uh, picture. Uh, so now the question is that the, the girl in the, on, with the blue coat is following the official path, supported by the information si system probably. The girl in the red uh, jacket is following, let's say, uh, the elephant trail, uh, the trail that people, uh, let's say, really use. And now the question is, is it wise, is it wise to pave this path? Is this a better path than the path that you've seen before? Of course, this is perhaps a bit of a strange example, but if you are looking at information systems, it's filled with data on how people actually do things. And we have seen many examples already today, and I think it's very important to, to, to use that type of data. And so here you see another example that I think is very funny. It's kind of uh, uh, probably the gate is a bit like how typical system administrators think, and they, they, they think that they should build a very secure system, but in reality, uh, let's say, as this desire line shows, the effect is completely uh, the other way around. So if you look at desire lines, then I, I say join them or fight them. And so if you think that this is 
people work like that and you would like to understand that and you would like to support people in doing that. That's one outcome. Another outcome is that you look at this desire line and that you say, well, this is completely undesirable. People should not do it in this way. Then you should use this information to build a better system. I think it's really stupid. Ignore it. And I think uh, many people, let's say, uh, in, involved in all kinds of, let's say, workflow, BPM, redesign type of projects, are often trying to ignore the data as long as they can. Uh, so, what are the goals? Kind of, if I would like to, let's say, rephrase my goal in a very uh, uh, simple way, it's another type of metaphor. I want to be uh, to build uh, process maps and systems that are as good as, let's say, real life maps and real life navigation systems. That, that's the, the the ultimate goal. Let's so say you see, for example, a map of Brisbane. Uh, we have seen. Also in the talks before, we have seen many spaghetti-like diagrams. That is how it often starts. And as Anna showed, you can always make it simpler if you would like uh, to do. But if you look at these spaghetti-like diagrams, they have fewer symbols than what you see here. So it's very strange that we everybody understands this. Uh, people have difficulty understanding the spaghetti-like uh, diagrams. And that's why uh, uh, we can, let's say, really use this metaphor to try to see how we can improve things by using colors, highlighting things that are important, etc. Et Another thing that I think uh, Google Maps is showing very elegantly, there is no such thing as DMAP. But I, but I find very odd if people that are involved in, let's say, business process modeling, they are very proud that they have spent the last five years on drawing diagrams that are in some repository, and the basic idea is they make a diagram and then they can say that they can change it. They rarely do, and it's cast in stone. Where, whereas I think that process maps should really be, let's say, you should generate maps based on what people would like to do. And so you should be able to zoom in to parts uh, that are important, and you can see that through process mining, you can do that already with existing uh, tools. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, another map of uh, Brisbane, and here you can see in red highlighting the bicycle paths. If you're in interested in, in cycling, you should have a different map than if you, I don't know, riding with a city cat over the river. Uh, also, uh, as I said before, it's very important to link models to data. It can be historic data, but it can also be live data. For example, here you see in real time the traffic jams. Uh, the, the things that are indicated in red at some morning in Brisbane in real time you can see where the traffic jams are if you're looking in an organization this would be the dream that the manager would be able to look at the map of the organization and see where are today my, my traffic jams and, 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 and I think this is we are very close to, to, to let's say making that possible today already uh, you can project other types of information. So, for example, here you can see where are the apartments that are for sale. But what I'm just trying to show is that at real time you would like to project all kinds of information on these types of maps. And making these maps really come alive rather than that they spend uh, their time in some, some drawer. Uh, the metaphor to a navigation <laughs> system, so here you can see a TomTom -tom, uh, device. Uh, uh, if you look at today's information system, they don't support you at all, or they force you to do a particular thing. And if you look at the nice thing of a navigation system, is that uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can use it, but you can also ignore it. And if you combine that with auditing, you create a kind of flexibility that many, flexibility and support that many systems are, are missing. And so <coughs> something goes wrong with the animation, but for example, at real time, it would make a, a, a sound if you are driving too fast. At least mine is constantly making noises like that. Uh, it, do, it makes a prediction. It will predict when you will arrive at your destination. How many information systems do you know when, when you are working on a case where it will actually give a prediction when it will be finished or that, whether something will happen? Uh, and it is re recommending me to take a certain uh, turn at a particular way. I can ignore it several times, and even if I do that, it will continue to support me. 
So this is what we <laughs> would like to do uh, if we are looking at information systems. Not things where people need to work behind the systems back to get things up. So this is the vision. This is what we are trying, trying to achieve. So on this slide you will find, uh, uh, I will briefly highlight some of the topics that we're working on and then uh, kind of going to some of them in a bit more uh, detail. And is that a pointer again? And, uh, let me use an old-fashioned stick. Yes. <laughs> I, I prefer this. Uh, so, so, so I have two pictures kind of giving an overview of, let's say, ongoing work and work that has recently been co completed. Uh, one thing that, uh, that has been very uh, important, that it's a kind of a bit of a follow-up of the, the PhD work that Anna did earlier, we are trying to replay reality on, on models. And what you often see is that reality does not exactly follow the model. So then you want to align this reality with this abstract model. And we have turned that into an optimization problem that given a path that deviates, you will find a path that is closest to a path that is possible according to the model. And then we highlight where in this closest path the deviations take place. So you can use that for conformance checking, let's say auditing like things that we have seen before. You can also use that for performance analysis. That's really important that if you show a model and reality is slightly different, you need to squeeze the reality into that model to be able to make reliable statements about performance. So uh, this is a very, very, uh, let's say, flexible technique that is used in, in, in many other projects uh, where we are applying process mining. Then there is the notion of uh, auditing. There are several people, let's say, working on that, where amongst others we are also using these types of things. But for example, we are also trying to identify what are typical auditing patterns that we would like to investigate. I like building a more or less complete repository of patterns that we would like to investigate. Another thing that you see here is that logs often contain also data. It's not just about control flow, so you would like to understand uh, 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 if you look at the decision, what is explaining that decision? Right? So we look at the data component. We also look at the resource component. And so, for example, we are uh, investigating phenomena, for example, that people have a tendency to start working faster if there are many things in their queue. And so this is a type of research where you are correlating workload with actual uh, uh, a speed at which we people work and we are kind of proving these kind of things that are just described in papers but you can now prove that on, on, on real data and then the question is how you can use such uh, information. Uh, as data sets get longer and I will tell a bit more about that uh, there is a need to kind of uh, do a different type of process mining where the, if the logs are so huge or so complicated you need to distribute uh, uh, things, and we are looking at te techniques to do so. Another approach is that you try to abstract. Uh, so J.C. Bowser just finished the PSD, and many of his techniques are related to uh, if you have a very low-level event log, so he was looking at the event data of X-ray machines within Philips. If you have very low-level data, how can you automatically kind of look at that process model at that process at a higher level? So he's identifying patterns that then become activities and that can be repeated in, in, in various ways. Also trace alignment is something that he has been working on to look at uh, event logs that contain a lot of detail right? because that's often uh, uh, something that is very complicated. Uh, there's also a reference here to the AXI project where we are looking at artifact-centric process mining that relates to the situation that uh, as Anna showed, but you could also see it in many other of the other talks, the starting point is always a case ID. The patient in the hospital, the customer order, etc., etc. But if you look at a system like SAP, there is no such thing as one case ID. You can look at uh, the customer order, you can look at the order line, you can look at the delivery, you can look at the life cycle of the customer, etc., etc. So there are many processes that are interacting with each other and this project is a European project that is focusing on exactly that uh, uh, topic. Uh, 
here you see some more things. So we are uh, uh, also trying to do uh, things related to visual analytics, where we are animating uh, history, not on top of a process model, but basically any type of map that you can imagine. Yeah, so, so it can be a, a, a geographic map, it can be an organizational map, but having this metaphor of having a log replayed, not just on a process model, because for, for many end users that will be too abstract, but on any type of, 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 of model you can think of. We look at, it may sound strange, but often people have models, and they may be too complicated, or they have models that do not fit completely. This is looking at the problem of improving the model based on, on event data. And so the model that people have, there are many deviations, but what is now a model that is very close to what what's kind of in between what people have modeled and what, hap what is happening in reality. And of course, this is an interactive active process to do that. I'll skip the, these things for a moment. It, it is related to uh, the types of process models that we are uh, uh, looking at. We are kind of constantly looking at new ways of representing processes because our insight with process mining showed that many of the traditional ways to visualize uh, a process models is not really the right way to do it. Another thing that I will briefly tell a bit uh, uh, more about is the notion of concept drift that uh, refers to the situation that the process is changing while you are analyzing it. Yeah, so you have variability in terms of cases, but the process itself is also uh, changing. Uh, I'll skip these other things for a moment because they will come back in the examples uh, later anyway. So let me uh, highlight uh, two points. The first point is uh, from one process model to many process models. Uh, so in many cases, people uh, think about what is the process model. And uh, kind of various exper experiences led us to believe that uh, it may be that you are not looking for a single process model, but that you're actually looking at a kind of cube of process models. And here I have three dimensions. But in principle, you could also view it in two or four or whatever. Uh, if you look at along this axis, you can see that processes change over time. If I look at the process now, it may be completely different from the process that I had in December. If you look here, it may be that, uh, that I have one organization with different departments executing similar processes. For example, you look at the Dutch courts. They have one information system, and you would like to compare how are the individual courts handling their cases. And you don't have one process model, but you have a process model per court. This is like if you would look at grouping. Uh, uh, cases may have particular properties, and you want to identify or you want to or you use a, a priori knowledge that there are different types of groups. So uh, for each of these cells in such a cube, but again, it can be two dimensions, it can be four dimensions. Uh, you would like to discover, let's say, process models. You would like to compare them. And you would like to, uh, 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 to, kind of to understand the differences between all of these things. So if we look at time, this is called concept drift analysis. So you're looking at a process, and that process, <coughs> we always assume that it is in steady state, but most processes are not in steady state. So it's like a second order dynamics, you want to understand how a process is changing over time, and this can be incredibly valuable for a, for, for a company, that if the process is changing, and they don't know about it, that can be, lead to very big disasters, especially if, they, if the flow times are relatively long. This refers to cross organizational process mining, where you look at basically the same type of process being executed at different lo locations. And this is looking at different groups, like a gold customer, silver customer, and these types of things. So let me give you some examples so that it becomes a bit more, more concrete. So look, for example, at a car rental agency like Hertz. Uh, they have branches all over the world at airports, in cities, etc., etc., they're all executing basically the same process. These processes may change over time. In January, it may be different than it is in March, and they have different type of customers. So, would you now like to build one process model for all of this? Would you like to have a process model 
just for the branch in Paris, just in January, you want to kind of play with this. Yeah, so you want to project your log to analyze certain things and you want to understand differences. Another project that we are running is the Coast Log project, where we are working with uh, 10 municipalities that are very interested in understanding uh, how they are doing things differently, and they would like to understand these differences and use that to improve their, uh, their processes. So, yeah, you, you could look, for example, at building permits. They have a particular value. It is done within different municipalities, and things change over time. Here is another example. It is taken, let's say, from uh, from from Suncorp in uh, Brisbane. Uh, that I was there, uh, let's say, last year when the city got flooded. Uh, that means that Suncorp got flooded by uh, uh, by insurance claims. They start changing their processes when something like that happens. Suncorp is a big company. These are some of the brands that they have. These brands are, uh, uh, they, they've taken over various other companies. Uh, kind of there are different variants of the same process for these different brands. There are also different types of insurance. As I hope that you can see is we are no, lo no longer looking for one process, but, but uh, let's say a cube of processes. And we would like to compare these various things. And so, so we would like to understand why are things done differently in one location compared to another location. When is my process changing? What is changing? Etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, 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 so these are for us new and interesting questions that come into reach while uh, let's say normal process mining is becoming much more mature. Uh, and then we can start let's say looking at these types of uh, problems. Just to, to highlight some things that you get a bit of idea, so, so this is work of J.C. Bose who looked at, uh, <coughs> at concept drift. So here you have cases, so here you see that this was the old process and suddenly it changes. For example, the law changes and from that point in time all cases need to be handled in a different way. This is a kind of change where you have, let's say, overlapping cases. Things, let's say, change but more gradually. This would be like what's called a recurring drift here. It could be that in December uh, they always work differently than in months where there's very little work to do. And there could also be like this incremental drift. Here you see, let's say, uh, real life data based on these municipalities that I mentioned before. If you look at, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the way that such a municipality process evolves. So these, these troughs here that you see, these are the points in time where our analysis discovers that something is changing. And for example, this is the process before, so this is this part, and this is let's say, this part. So you, so you can compare the differences. Uh, this is also taken, let's say, from this municipality uh, uh, logs, as so here you can see them mentioned. Here we look at four uh, variants of the same process. And so these are process models that represent the same process but executed differently within the individual municipalities. And here you see a matrix where we are comparing logs to these models that you see here. And you can see on the diagonal we have a high, let's say, a high conformance yeah, because of course, people execute their own process properly, but you can see the degree of similarity between these municipalities, and you can also see the effect on on times. Yeah, so, 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 so you can uh, uh, you can really try to understand why are things done differently, what kind of effects does it have, and can one one municipality learn from the other one. Uh, this part I will do a bit. Uh, let's say more quickly. Uh, in many of the process mining applications that we have today, I think performance is not an issue. That would be just saw the speed uh, a bit. But as this, as this technology gets more and more mature, it will be applied to more and more complicated uh, uh, problems. Uh, especially in an online setting, where there may be huge amounts of data which are never actually stored, but which, which you would like to use. So uh, we are looking at, let's say, two types of problems. 
one type, eh, so this represents an event log, eh, so it's a English term of log. We look at how we can split log and distribute the problem, but by using multiple computers to solve the same problem. Uh, this is looking at if you have lots of data, another solution could be to just forget about it, eh, that, that you just remember the things that, that are important. Well, I don't think that I need to elaborate on the, on, on the growth of data. Everybody kind of now sees the big data uh, uh, development. When we started doing this more than a decade ago, many people were saying that we were crazy. There was not such event data. Today we are flooded by data. And of course, data quality is still an important issue, but nobody can deny that there is no data, no, no event data available everywhere today. The other thing is that in 18 months, there will be twice as much as there is today. That's a law. Yeah, so you, you, it's not, not a guess, you can just prove that that will happen. Uh, so eventually, uh, this will be used more and more. So one approach is to distribute process discovery problems. So we would like to discover a process model. How can we distribute it? We are looking at conformance checking. So we have a log, we have a log and we have a model. And we would li we'd like to see where reality is deviating. How can we distribute them? And especially this uh, let's say conformance checking problem can be distributed very easily. Yeah, so you can scale it with as many computers as you have. So I was talking about splitting the log, and I do not have any time to, to kind of discuss this in detail. But if you have any, an event log, a very naive approach would be to just cut the log like this. Yeah, so just half of the traces are analyzed on one computer, the other half are analyzed on another computer, and you merge the results. Uh, you, can, you can get very easily, let's say, speed-ups which are uh, linear with respect to the number of machines that you have. If you have 10 machines, it goes 10 times as fast. Uh, you can also split the log like this, and then you have a speed-up which is uh, often much faster than linear. Uh, because many of the mining algorithms are exponential in the number of activities. Uh, it's a bit technical, but by doing like this, there is the potential of gaining much more speed, that you can uh, solve problems which are, let's say, an order of magnitude more complicated than we can do uh, to, to today. And one of the techniques that we are looking at is like decomposing <coughs> event logs based on activities using a, a notion which is called the passage, and that leads to the situation where you can look at a relatively small number of activities, analyze the process model for these activities, do that for different set of activities, and in the end glue all these results together. And you, you can uh, get incredible speed ups in, in that way. So that's one technique, distributing process mining problems. Another technique is, uh, uh, is to forget. And you often need to forget in the situation where you have streaming data. Uh, so, uh, it is not just a storage problem. Uh, so, so like uh, uh, storing event data is not, uh, people talk about big data, etc. But actually storing the data is not the problem. The actual problem is the analysis of the data. Uh, that, 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 that's where the real, uh, let's say, challenge is. But also for that you need to forget. Uh, you should not linearly walk through an event log that kind of uh, uh, records uh, the whole of eternity. So things that you can use, for example, it's a well-known technique, you can use sampling. You just take, you just remember representative cases and you learn over that. You can also aggregate things in terms of a, a profile so that you quickly uh, can show results uh, in an online setting. Because I was kind of, uh, if I look at the talks that I heard this afternoon, <coughs> it was always process mining done offline. Well, I think in the future uh, it is relatively easy using these types of techniques to do process mining on the fly. At any point in time, uh, you look at where are your traffic jams, you predict things for the future, etc. Et but there, for these types of techniques, you need to forget. And note that there is a very strong correlation with this notion of concept drift. If you're looking at streaming data, your process will change, so therefore you do not want to remember your whole history. 
yeah, because the things that are very far away in the past <coughs> are not very good predictors for what will happen, let's say, today or tomorrow. Okay, to come to a conclusion, uh, uh, I hope I gave you some insights in the things that we are uh, working on. Uh, our goal is to, uh, uh, to kind of uh, make business process management, let's say, a more serious job, where people are not just drawing diagrams, uh, uh, but you are analyzing, let's say, real hard uh, data. Some of the talks this afternoon, people were asking, it's like, it's difficult to convince people. And of course, this is a new technology, so it will take some time to be able to sell this very easily. At the same time, what I see, let's say, in practice, is that there are large organizations are paying people to draw diagrams. If you look at Suncorp, they have a repository with 8,000 process models. People are spending all of their time uh, drawing and looking at these models. It is completely pointless compared to the business case of, uh, of process mining. And so, of course, there was nobody that ever said, okay, let's have a team of 10 people drawing pictures for the rest of their life. Nobody made that decision. And I think with respect to process mining, the business case is much better, but you, yeah, you, you need to put it into a context uh, that serves a purpose for the organization at that point in time. Of course, there are also people that do not like to see reality. I think if you have done these projects in practice, you kind of meet these people uh, let's say regularly. People that do not like uh, this game, which is called reality. Uh, however, I think that there is a, uh, let's say, despite these challenges, there are challenges in research, there are also challenges in, uh, in uh, uh, like how to, to make this easily applicable in reality. But despite these challenges, I think there is a very bright uh, future. I think there are two things working for us at this point in time. One thing is that we know that there will be an exponential growth of event data. So you know exactly, let's say, in 2050 how much event data there will be. So you know that this technology will become valuable and that it should be able to deal with, uh, with large amounts of data. And what we can also see today is that there are very mature mining algorithms that you can apply today. This is not, let's say, some academic exercise into the future. It's something that you can do already today. Uh, for people, it may be interesting to, 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 let's say, point out two things, also trying to make some advertisements here at the end, if one will allow me. Uh, one thing is the process mining manifesto. There is an IEEE task force on process mining, which is uh, uh, trying to promote this topic. And I think the promotion of this topic is very important, let's say, for all of us, that we do this in an active, unified way. So I hope that you will all, let's say, help me with doing this. It is currently available in, uh, in 13 different languages. So you see English, Korean, and, uh, and German. But there are 10 more. Uh, so help us in distributing this thing. Uh, also, uh, look at this beautiful book if you did not see it. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ben. Anyone questions towards Bill before we close? Please. Um, <clears throat> could you explain a little bit how you would relate uh, complex event processing towards process mining, and especially uh, concerning aggregation of fraction of process models? Of course, if you look at complex. Uh, Complex event processing, there is really, let's say, uh, a link. It would be a way to actually extract events that you're interested uh, in. Uh, so there is a relationship. I think the difference here is that uh, the starting point that we look at are really, let's say, uh, processes rather than isolated events. And I think it's a bit like what is the difference between, I don't know, rules and let's say, processes. In my view, there is a... Uh, uh, difference, but of course you could try to apply, let's say, both te technologies. Uh, so I think that complex, complex event processing could be used as input, let's say, for doing process mining analysis. Uh, so that would definitely be possible. There, often as a as a designer, you need to encode what you uh, want to have. 
whereas, for example, I refer to JC's uh, work, where you are kind of discovering these low-level frequent patterns that you would then like to, to analyze further. As I would say, process mining is more, let's say, explorative, uh, understanding what is going on, rather than that you already know what you want and, and then want to code it. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Okay, so then uh, do you have a question? So, uh, time okay. for drinks. Thank you. Yeah, time for drinks. <laughs>So let me say two, two more sentences before we go into the drinks. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank a lot Elham and Tyne who have helped us a lot with the registration process and throughout the whole day. So give them an applause, please. And all of our speakers, so we are very grateful that you have shared our, uh, your experiences here with us today. We have actually a process mining t-shirt for you, a process mining <laughs> camp t-shirt, as, as a thank you. So let's, um, let's look at that in a minute together. Uh, and finally, and last but not least, all of you, we are really happy that so many of you have come here. It's so important to build community and to exchange ideas and to just get to know each other. Um, so thanks for coming and let's enjoy the drinks.